Hey everyone, this is Tim Chavez from Faith Matters. For today's episode, we spoke with Brooke Romney, a guest that had been recommended to us over and over, and we were so happy that we were able to connect with her. Brooke is a writer who began her career on Capitol Hill and whose work has appeared in many publications, including in the Washington Post. She now spends much of her time writing and speaking, in particular on the subject of parenting, but also on social media connection and faith. In 2021, she published 52 Modern Manners for Today's Teens, which reached number one on Amazon's best-selling parenting books list and climbed as high as number 29 in its entire catalog of 38 million books. She's also published I Like Me Anyway, Embracing Imperfection, Connection, and Christ. In our conversation with Brooke, we did talk a lot about parenting, but so many of the principles were really broadly applicable. Specifically, we spent time on creating connection with all of the people around us, including our children. We talked about some of the habits that are easy to slip into that can be disconnecting, and simple things we may not have thought of that can create moments of connection. We also talked about living from our values and being willing to be misunderstood and receive feedback when we're doing so. As Brooke says, listening to other perspectives, even if it's difficult, is how we get better. We are so grateful to Brooke for the time that she took to come on the podcast, and we really think you're going to enjoy hearing from her. To follow Brooke and her work, you can head to her website at brookeromney.com, or you can find her books on Amazon. She's also on Instagram at brookeromneywrites. Thanks, as always, for listening, and with that, we'll jump right in. Well, Brooke, thank you so much for being here. We're super excited to have you on. Me too. Thanks. I love being able to talk about faith. We we picked up your book uh, almost a year ago, probably, and our 14-year-old daughter just absolutely just loves this book from the very first second that she saw it. And every Monday night she grabs the book and uses one of the, one of the manners from the the book to, to teach the rest of us. And it's been really, really, honestly, really fun. So, so thank you for that. Um, That is so cool. Makes me so happy. It's been good for us too. I feel like (laughs) I wrote the book and I still, every time we flip the page, I'm like, Oh yeah, I need to work on that one. So yeah, work in progress for all of us, no matter how old you are. So. Okay. Glad to hear we're in, we're a good company. Would you mind telling, telling us and our, our listeners more about how you sort of find yourself doing the work that you're doing now? Sure. I have always been a writer and I've done all kinds of different writing. So I wrote for congressmen, newspapers, magazines, and then when everything turned to digital, I lived in Michigan and I started doing the blogs where you talk about, Hey, go here with your kids and do this we moved to Utah about 10 years ago and I found myself really wanting to write. And so I, one day I just wrote an article that something that I felt a little deeper about, and it's actually way easier to be online talking about where to take your kids than it is to share your heart. And 10 years ago, I did not have a very thick skin and it hurt my feelings when people didn't agree with me. And I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to share that my heart online. I hit publish and the article went viral and people, it allowed people to start thinking. And I realized that maybe I did have something to say and maybe I would be okay. Even if other people didn't like what I had to say to put it out there. So I started writing a little bit more often for a newspaper. I started putting some things up on my own blog and just about maybe six years ago, seven years ago, I jumped on Instagram and then it just kind of grew and my community grew. As I started talking about teenagers, I realized there was a really big gap in the market where people wanted a place where they could talk about teens and and learn and feel like they were part of a community that didn't really exist before. So that's where I'm at, wrote Modern Manners, wrote I Like Me Anyway. I love being an author. There's times when I wish I could just do it anonymously, but I also really enjoy the community that it has helped me be a part of. So wow. that, well, that was that. Well, that was perfect. That was so succinct and we love the community too. So that was a great place to bring us. One thing that's a little bit tricky about putting words on paper and putting them out for other people to read is that I think it, it's easy to feel trapped in your original self. You know, that if you write something that you have to defend that until your dying day. And so I imagine that as you grow and you change and you evolve and naturally change your mind, that it might be hard that people are going to push back against that and, and hold you accountable for things that you wrote before, you know, as you were evolving. And so I kind of wonder, maybe that has, is part of the reason why you've kind of become this expert on parenting teens, because that's sort of their lives, right? Like every, every six months, they're like a new person <laughs> and they're always pushing against the, these boundaries that maybe even friends are sort of enforcing that you're changing and this feels, and I, and I, I'm resisting that and we're resisting that as, as friends. And then social media really amplifies that. And so I, I wonder if you could just kind of talk about like how, how you view 
this this life path of just constant evolution and, and what kind of stressors do you recognize in your own life but also that you see in in your teams so when you start putting things out online you will be attacked for for what you're saying or people have a different viewpoint one of the things that has really helped me is being true to my own values and my intentions and as long as i am clear on who i am um, then it's okay if people misunderstand me. And every once in a while, I'll need to correct them if it's, it's, if it's a gross misunderstanding. But if it's something where someone actually doesn't care about me, I'm okay to let that go. If, if somebody wants to engage in a true conversation, I'm more than happy to, to kind of dig in. But if somebody's badgering me or, you know, trying to be a jerk or, or you see they didn't even read it and they're just, you know, yeah. I'm okay to let those things go. A couple of years ago, my husband and I went to marriage counseling and we had this awesome counselor who was sharing. So we were kind of sharing our situations and kind of where we thought we could use some help. And he said a few things to my husband. And then he looked at me and he said, you need to get tougher. And I was like, what? But I'm so nice. And I like, that's a value of mine. And I care and all these things. He's like, that's great. But no relationship can improve if someone's not willing to hear something that's hard. So how much do I care? How much do I care about this relationship enough to have my feelings hurt and hear maybe what I'm doing isn't perfect? Something similar happened when I wrote, I like me anyway, I was almost ready to take it to a publisher. And then I had an amazing author who said she'd be willing to take a look. And as she looked at my book, I was ready. It was time to go to print. I had been working on it for a year. I truly was sick of it. I just wanted it to be finished. And she took a look at my book. And she had me come over to her house and she said, when I write a book, I take out the chapters and I say, is this chapter great or good? And if it's good, it goes away. And so she told me that I had three chapters that were just good and they needed to go away. And then she told me I needed to change like the main focus of the book. I needed to bring each chapter into this, this narrative and this story. It was going to take so much work and all this rewriting. And I was like, I don't want I don't want to do that. I'm tired and I'm sick of it. And I just want to go. But truly those changes that she made helped the book reach people that it wouldn't have reached and become something that wasn't just good. It was great. If I want to be great, then I have to be able to listen to criticism. I have to hear other sides of the story. I have to appreciate feedback and take it in. And then I also have to understand where my own values are and be true to myself. Cause sometimes the feedback that comes, you know, there were a few things that she said, maybe she didn't love that I actually loved and kept in. And sometimes, you know, when my husband and I are working something out, there's feedback from him that I'm like, yes, that is absolutely important that I take that and change. And sometimes it's feedback that I need to take back to him and say, okay, I need more on this. Um, and I just think with our religion and eternal progression, we're never finished. But if we're unwilling to change that saying, I think I'm finished now. And I don't think I'm finished. And I hope I'm not finished, right? There's so much more. I, I love that you brought up sort of this, this theology of eternal progression that we have, because it's so, it's so key to everything that we're, that we're doing. And, and it's very apparent in your work. I, I wonder if you're, if you could talk a little bit about your, your own faith journey, I'd be super curious if over these last 10 years, as, you, as you've been more uh, open and vulnerable online, if your own faith has progressed or evolved in some way along with the rest of your work. Yeah. I mean, I think part of, part of growing up is kind of being willing to think and tackle things you weren't willing to before. I probably will get time frames wrong, but it was probably just a little over 10 years ago. And we just had some really knowledgeable, brilliant, brilliant, truly brilliant friends that we loved and respected that had a lot of questions about the church. And I, because I'm curious, and one of the things that I love about my mind is that I can see lots of different angles on lots of different things. And that's really good in a lot of ways, but sometimes can take you down sort of wandering paths that aren't as productive. And so I got really curious about what they were thinking and why they were thinking. And I was diving in to the articles they were posting and things like that. And um, one day I realized that I was spending a lot of time trying to take down my faith and I was spending very little time feeding my faith. And the interesting part about this journey for me is it was probably the least content that I've been. And I felt very, I felt just frustrated and angsty and I wanted to kind of go to battle. And the more I've learned about faith journeys, 
Um, that is a natural part of a faith journey, right? Being frustrated and finding out things that you didn't like before and, and feeling a little combative and, and all those things. Now that I know that that's part of it, I'm okay as I look back and realize that that's, that's what I was doing. And I was trying to figure out what I thought with what I knew and, and all that. But it took a little while. And I finally came to the conclusion that looking at the fruits of what I knew that it was where I wanted to be, whether there were still questions or whether things were perfect or not. And once I decided that things weren't perfect, everything wasn't settled, but I think because of my intention of looking for reasons that I did believe, looking for fruits, looking for why it works for me, helped me understand where I really wanted to be, where before I was looking for all the why nots. Um, I know that's not the journey for everyone. And I think that for some people it takes a long time and sometimes there's a different, different conclusion at the end. But what I had to really understand was where my spirit wanted me to be. And I think that can be helpful in anyone's faith journey, wherever they end up saying, what do I believe? What sounds right? Where are the fruits that I want to be a part of? And we may not all end up in the exact same spot. But my wish for everyone is that they are in a place where they feel peace and joy and love and also a little bit of discomfort, a little bit of push, a little bit of willingness to say, maybe I should dig in. Maybe I should try more. um, Maybe I should explore in a way that feels really good um, to my heart in the end. Yeah. I think for everybody, there's this journey of self-authorship that where we start, if we're somewhere, for instance, in an institution like the church, and we're there because we feel like we have to be, then we sort of like resist that until we can, until we can really start to integrate what we want and what we feel and what our spirit is sort of striving towards. And once for me, this has been the case too. Once I felt that I'm truly making this decision for myself to be here, then it starts to be okay uh, for doubts, questions and problems to remain. And yet I can, and yet I can still feel good about the decision that I've made. Yeah, there's something so beautiful about being in a place where you're willing to believe and willing to be a part of something and being able to say, this this is not perfect. I still feel a rub right here. This is slightly unsettling to me, or I didn't love the way that went and saying, and I still believe. I think for a long time, I thought it was either perfect, you know, like it all had to check out and, you know, be exactly right in line with all the ways that I thought or it couldn't be true. And it's just so great to be in a spot where you feel like both things can coexist and that you can still find a lot of joy and happiness in belief and faith and activity without needing it all to just be in this perfectly wrapped present that always looks and feels exactly like you want it to. I really resonate with that, but do you feel like that required you to sort of redefine what you expected church to be? Because I, I think that's something that I actually had to deconstruct. Not, not, I mean, the church itself was an issue, but also just like my idea, my idea of how the church should function in my life kind of had to shift because I started with this idea that it was the, it was this perfect thing that had the answers. And if I dug deep enough, the answers would reveal themselves and there was nothing to be wrestled with. And so I like the idea that it can be a vehicle for connection and maybe there are other vehicles that would work too. And, and I, st- and I felt like that kind of relieved a little bit of the pressure to have great answers, but do you, have you found that? Do you feel like you've had to sort of redefine the point? So one of the things, like when I was struggling a little bit, uh, a guy in my ward bore a testimony that resonated so deeply with me. And he said that he believes that there are tons of ways to get back to our father in heaven and that the church is the very best vehicle for him to get there. And other people might jump into a different car or might want to take a bus or might want to crawl there. But for him, the church is this beautiful vehicle that allows him to understand Jesus Christ and is the very best and clearest and easiest way for him to get back to his heavenly father. And when he shared that, I just had chills. Even when I shared it just now, like I just had chills because that made so much sense for me that 
it, it might be, you know, you might still get a flat tire. It might not be the shiniest vehicle on the road. There might be times when you're like, ah, I wish I could, you know, I wish I could have that car. I wish I could change the paint color, but it is the vehicle that brings me to Christ who will bring me to God. And as I've, you know, thought about things and explored, I love being able to take parts of other great belief systems and religions that help, you know, me get to Jesus Christ. But in the end, it's my covenants. It's what I learn and what I know in the community that's created that really feels like for me gets me closest to being back to my heavenly father. So that's really beautiful. beautiful. I, I'm curious to what extent when you're, when you're writing today and not necessarily on a subject specific to faith, but if you're writing about uh, parenting or family or marriage or whatever it is, to what extent do you feel like your faith is sort of infusing that work that you're, that you're doing? So it's really interesting for a while I was writing just about anything that came to mind. And I wrote a lot more faith-based pieces. Now my audience is mostly there for parenting advice. And so I try to do a lot about parenting, but one of the things that always I try to check myself is, is this in line with the way that our heavenly parents would deal with us? Is this in line with the way that God would want me to see myself and to see my kids? So honestly, it infuses everything that I do in probably a more subtle way. I absolutely believe that there is truth that resonates with every person. And sometimes when I write a post, you can tell that people feel the truth of it, regardless of what religion they're a part of. And I really try to check myself, even if someone, I, I get a lot of messages from parents who are struggling with their kids. And whenever I give advice, I really do my best to think, would this advice check out with the way that our heavenly parents have chosen to parent us? Oh, I love that. And I'd love to kind of shift now and and on that note, talk about parenting a little bit. I think maybe the hardest thing, you know, we're just starting this journey with teenagers We have a 14 year old and 12 year old. So this is sort of new, but I feel like one of the hardest things for me is that when they were young, it was very clear what they should be next. You know, it was like, I was making decisions for them, what they should wear and where they were going to go to school and what time. And I was going to do their hair and tell them how to do it. And it was all really crystal clear. And I know at some point they're going to reach adulthood and it will the power would have, will have totally shifted. And I'm not sure when that exchange happens, but I think that might be part of the messiness of being a teenager that you're both sort of trying to navigate that. And, and so I love this idea that you're constantly checking yourself with, you know, how our heavenly parents deal with us. But when it comes to this intersection of teenagers and faith and, and the idea of heavenly parents guiding us without coercing us, how do you teach your kids about your faith? in a way that is totally empowering, but also that can be genuinely influential for their lives? So I think it's different for every family, absolutely, and different personalities. But one of the things that I felt really, really strongly about is, okay, so teenagers want to be a part of things that are good for them, right? They're self-focused. It's a time of life where they're supposed to be. And if they watch their parents not enjoying what they're a part of, right? Oh, okay. We got to go to church. Oh my gosh. It's, I'm so glad it's two hours now. You used to be three and I'm so glad it's two. And <laughs> okay. I have so many meetings and this is oh, it's so annoying. I don't, I, the church is so inefficient. I hate the way it operates. And, you know, all these things, or it's time oh, we got to do ministering. Like this ministering thing is so hard. Our family has never let us come in or whatever. Like they are not going to want to be a part <laughs> of that. <laughs> they are so smart. They are so smart. And they're going to look at that from, from the outside and think, well, as soon as I'm 18, like I'm out of that, like, that looks something I do not want to continue to take part of. And so one of my focuses has always been to make sure that we're emphasizing the joy of the gospel, the fruits of the spirit, how much peace we feel when our lives are in alignment with what we know the beauty of being part of kind of a messy community. My dad was sick a few years ago and we were spending a lot of time in the hospital. And just the fact that meals kept showing up on our doorstep when it wasn't even me that was sick, making sure our kids know this is what, this is what Jesus looks like, like in our neighborhood, in our zip code. This is what it looks like to be part of something that Jesus is a part of really doing what we can to emphasize 
the positive parts. And of course, there's still negatives. Of course, there's going to be annoyances and things like that. But if we want our kids to choose to be a part of it, we better make sure that it looks like something that they would want to be a part of. And I think there's a lot of power in the way we see things and the way we talk about them. One of, one of the big questions that I'm I'm having too, as our, as our kids get older, is how to encourage things while letting a kid really become who they are. And I think one of the, some of the most toxic aspects of relationships that I've seen at times has been when somebody truly has an agenda for somebody else and needs needs them to do something. So how do you how do you think about that from a parent's perspective? And this is even just in a secular way, just generally. Yeah. You know? So I believe that the spirit is our best parenting tool. So recently one of our kids decided ended up like where something didn't work out, right? He didn't make a team that he really wanted to make, which changes your life. So we gave him some time to um, just kind of, it's time to explore. And we did a lot of encouragement and, and trying to give him lots of opportunities to figure something out for himself. After quite a few months, he had not figured something out for himself. And we watched as he was just not spending his time in ways that we felt were best for him. And so I went to him, my husband and I talked about it a bunch. We'd done lots of things to encourage, Hey, let's do this. And, and even helped him make some of those steps. Cause I think sometimes we throw our kids into the deep water and expect that they should get it and do it. And they're like, I'm 15. Like, I have no idea what I'm doing. You know, there, there needs to be some, some guardrails and some scaffolding. So we've get, we've given him some time to, to be sad and to try and figure something out. And he did a little bit here and there. And so I finally went to him and I just said, Hey, every person in order to grow needs things in their life that challenge them and that are hard for them. That is just a truth of our existence. What do you have right now in your life that is challenging you or pushing you? And we went through and he's very lucky with school. So that's not super hard for him. And he's got great friends. And so there was really nothing that was challenging him. And so I made some suggestions and I just said, so you can decide between these two things, but I'm signing you up and, and you're going to go and you're going to do it. And, uh, and he was willing to do that. And so for me, I really relied on the spirit to kind of let him figure that out. But I think sometimes when we let our kids who are, who are young, they're not sure. And they're just going to flounder. And I think that's sometimes what our heavenly parents do to us. Okay, go ahead. You figure it out, make your decisions, mm -hmm. try some things. This looks great. And then sometimes we get chastised and Hey, love you. You're not doing enough. You're not continuing to grow and change and become. And so now I'm going to put you in this situation that is going to be uncomfortable for you. And I think it's okay as parents to do that. I was, it's really important. I think that when there are choices that they have some control. And I know that this situation, if people are listening, they're like, that would never work for my kid. And I totally understand that there are kids that I have that that wouldn't have worked for either, but that's when you rely on the spirit. Okay. What yeah. will work? Does it mean that, okay, I'm sorry, I'm no longer, you know, going to pay for gas or I won't pay for your insurance. So somebody's going to be motivated to get a job or whatever it is, but I'm really relying on the spirit and reflecting and saying, where is my heavenly father? Okay. When I'm doing nothing, you know, is my heavenly father? Okay. When I'm not, when I'm burying my talents because I'm scared, he wants us to grow. So, yeah. And what's coming up for me is how clear it is that that was motivated by love for your son, not out of fear that you're going to have a child who is flailing and is not figuring his life out. And I, I think that's, that's a really tricky thing to, that we kind of always have to be navigating that, you know, what, what of this is motivated by my own fear about what it means about me as a parent and, and what do I genuinely out of love want to do for this child to help them have a happy life. But that gets so complicated. And I think especially especially in the, these spheres of faith, it gets really complicated because our, our, because we're so intertwined. It's kind of hard to parse that out, I think. But also maybe we are coming at a parenting issue with love, but do you worry sometimes that our teens can perceive that as conditional love? Like when we're offering incentives or, or, you know, trying to, we're really, we're manipulating in the, in the most altruistic way, <laughs> but mm -hmm. do you, do you see that sometimes that can be perceived as a conditional sort of love? 
Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think it can, I think it has a lot more to do with the relationship that you've built mm-hmm. up to that point and whether they see you as someone who mostly cares about them looking good and your family looking good, or if you're somebody that truly cares about who they are and has faith in the process and the plan. And that is something that you have to grow into because that fear is the most natural for all of us. And it sometimes takes some situations to kind of shake that out. I had a neighbor who I just, I love this story. So I want to tell it because I thought it was so beautiful. So she had a son who was 18 and he came to her and was like, Hey, I just don't know about the church. I don't know if I'm interested in it. And I just wanted you to know. And she just said, okay, I understand that. I just want you to know how important I think it is for everyone to have faith in their life and to believe in something bigger than themselves. And so I would love for you for the next year to explore that. And I would love to come with you. So if you don't believe in our church, that's totally fine. I would love for you to find something that you believe in. And, and so he actually He knew, so it was, it was really beautiful to me because he could tell that for his mom, the thing that was most important to her was that he believed in something bigger than himself. Not that he was going to put his mission papers in it. Like, do you believe in something bigger than yourself and, and how important that was to her and that she was willing to explore it with him. And so for, for about a year, he explored different ways of belief and what he thought. And because she didn't want to give him the free pass to just say like, I'm out, you know, because she truly believes in, in faith. And so he spent the next year kind of exploring different religions and ways of belief. And she was a part of it with him. And after a year, he came to her and to his dad and just said, um, I think I believe in the church that you raised me in. And it was Awesome. And then he took a little bit of time, I believe, to be able to go on a mission and and to really like fully choose that path. But what I love about this story and about this woman is she wasn't scared. She wasn't scared. If he ended up becoming a different religion, she was okay with that. She has so much faith in the plan and the eternal plan and who he is and who God is that she was like, if you want to take some time to explore God in a different way and be a part of that, as long as you have faith in your life, like that's okay with me. And I think that lack of control and fear on her part allowed him to do that and also allowed him to come back and say, I believe in the religion you brought me up in because he wasn't trying to be spiteful or be like, I will never let them know that I believe because they showed trust and faith in who he was. Wow. Um, yeah. On the inside. So I yeah, just, it- I just, that's beautiful. And it's like you said, kids, they're just, they're really smart. Like they can sense, even if it's just on a subconscious level, if a reaction is coming out of love or if it's coming out of fear. And I, I know that my own kids, even though they're a bit younger, their reactions are completely different based on where, where I'm coming from. Even if, even if I think I'm presenting it the same, you know, the same way logically, like there is a, there is a sixth sense about the, the sort of love or fear paradigm. And uh, you, you, you also mentioned, you know, having a foundation of, of connection and how that can really change how these types of conversations go for parents who, you know, and it's, it's an important thing too, for teens to start to individuate, right. And create their own and find their own identities. So for a parent who wants to stay deeply connected to their kid, but also allow them to, to have and find that, that their own identity, what are some ideas or tips that you have for maintaining that, that connection? Okay. This is something I talk about a lot online because I just feel like it's foundational, like truly it's foundational to where your relationship goes, but I'll just give you three things that I think make a difference. The first one is seeing the good in them and vocalizing it as often Mm -hmm. as possible. And this is especially important for kids who there is not a lot of good to see. Start small. I remember a time when it was like, thank you for waking up today. That was like, as good as it got. Hey, you did such a great job at getting out of bed. And that was like about the only good thing that we had seen for the day, you know? So seeing the good and vocalizing it, kids need to know through words, through actions that you see them, that you think a lot of times, like a lot of our conversations with our teenagers are about things we would like them to change. 
And I think we need to really think about that. I think like the ratio is supposed to be like eight to one, eight positives for every one negative. And especially when you're not seeing your teens a lot. And when you see them, you're like, Hey, like, why is your room still a mess? Or I saw that you hadn't turned that assignment in really think about, have I said eight great positive things to them? Hey, I'm so happy to see you. You look darling. Or, Hey, I saw your grades. Looks like you're doing amazing in gym, whatever, like positive (laughs) things, you know? The second one is to not forget about physical touch when they are teenagers. I'm so bad at this. This is something. So I am not a physical touch person by nature. And I have to make a conscious effort to touch them, rub their back, give them hugs. It's it's weird when all of a sudden your kids are bigger than you are and you're like, oh, hey, okay. It was so easy for me to put kids on my lap and love them. But as they got bigger, it was very like different. And I had to make a conscious effort to, to hug them and make them feel loved. And then the third thing that I think is so important is to make them feel like you don't just love them, but you like them. During the teenage years, they are going to have 1 million days where it feels like nobody wants them around, where it feels like they're not good enough or they're not included and coming home to parents who also feel that way. I'm going to get emotional, but like it breaks my heart that someone might feel like there's no space where somebody wants them. And even if they're rotten and even if they're going through the worst time ever, They have to feel like parents don't just like, love them, but they like them. And so sometimes you have to speak it into existence. I'm so happy you're home, even though you're like, you are actually so difficult and I'm not happy you're home. You cause so much contention in our house, but I'm so happy you're home. Even if they go right up to their room or if you're going somewhere, Hey, I would love you to come with me to Costco. I'll let you pick out like whatever you want for dinner whatever you can do to just make them feel wanted. And they might not always take you up on it, but, but making them feel liked and wanted. So those are my three. Wow. Those are so so practical. Yeah, seriously. Okay. So I (laughs) ask you though, like, I I feel like that, that really makes me feel inspired. That feels like something so tangible I can start doing right this minute. But I also feel like you need a full cup to be able to, to do all of those things with a teenager who is not giving you those feelings naturally. You know, if you're dreading all day, them coming home, it's so hard to put on a smile, you know? And so, so talk to the parents who, who do not have a full cup and who, who, who is not, who are not having this, this relationship, like this full loving, all these feelings come up naturally. Like how, how do you like get yourself into a headspace where you can do this with integrity and, and without feeling like you're you're being fake. Cause I think that, I think, you know, they, they'll be able to sense that too, but if the desire is there, like, how do you, how do you meet the desire? Okay. So, so two things, first of all, if you do it, even if you're being fake and even if it's hard, you will see a difference in your relationship. And after a while it won't be so hard. So that's my first pointer. Sometimes we have to do things that don't feel natural and feel weird. And sometimes I think, being an actor as a parent is one of the most important things you can do because (laughs) once you do it and once you breathe into it, your kids will start to feel it and your relationship won't feel as hard. You absolutely 100% will make headway in what you're trying to do. The second thing though, is that parents of teenagers often feel I've heard a lot. It's not my story to tell. There's all these hard tumultuous things going on in their lives And they are suffering in silence with no one to talk to. And sometimes like a spouse can be helpful, but sometimes when two people are so close to something that's difficult, they can't offer a lot of perspective or a lot of help. Like you're just in the trenches with each other and you can't kind of see above that eye level. So my, one of the things that absolutely saved me during really difficult times is you have to have someone that you can talk to. You have to, somebody that can get you out of the weeds and make you feel like either for one, that you're not alone or for two, that it's not going to last forever or for three, that you're equipped to deal with, with the situation that you have. And I suggest finding somebody that's slightly removed, even a grandparent or an aunt is sometimes a little bit too close, but if you can find like a friend or a neighbor, look for somebody that's 10 years older than you are. Just say, I am struggling. And I just need someone to bounce some ideas off and to talk to. 
Um, it's so important to find somebody that you can trust and the ideal person loves you and also loves your kid. Somebody that can see the good in your child. And I know those are so many parameters and sometimes it might be somebody you have to pay like a coach or a therapist or something, but just having someone that you can just say, Oh my word, the school called me again. What am I even supposed to do? Or they snuck out again. What? And sometimes that person won't have answers, but they'll just have some support and love and remind you that you have everything you need to get through this. And I always remembered that God knew who I was and he knew who my kids were. And he thought that we were the perfect match. And so even in times when I felt like there is no way I can do this, I knew that God knew that I could. And that somehow, like I was the exact person that my child needed in that moment. And I, there's, you have to have support. You have to have people that can back you up. You have to have people that can, can lift you, but just keeping that in mind that like, I was fully equipped for everything that would come after us. So, oh my gosh, I love that so much. Thank you. What about for maybe less turbulent relationships, but I I think everybody probably shares this desire to have the relationships that you see in a movie or like you hear about where, where they have this, they're so close and the, and the kids tell their parents everything. And they feel like that there's just this, this intimacy that is sometimes, sometimes unfathomable. (laughs) Can you talk to parents about how to create relationships that feel like there really is, there's really not a barrier to communication. Like how do you open that up and help kids to talk? Cause I think it's so easy to become overbearing that you actually shut them down. You're smothering them with your openness. You know? Right. And yeah. It's so that's easy like, to do wrong. That's a really good reminder because I think, I don't know, for me, more is more, right? Okay. Let's have another <laughs> deep conversation. Let's, you know, and I think there's a few, just, just a couple of tips that I would give. Teens like to, teens like things light. They like to have fun. They like to know that you're somebody besides the person that's like, how's your faith doing? Right. <laughs> That is not a conversation that's going to build connection. That's a conversation you have after you've built connection. (laughs) So just being together, being a part of their world, like, Hey, you know, if you have a kid who plays Fortnite, sit and play it with them or watch. If you have a girl that's super into makeup and you don't even like makeup, but saying, Oh my gosh, how did you figure out how to do that with your eyes? Being part of their world is something that's really important that will allow them to feel like Um, You're someone that's not disapproving of everything they do or like, or want to be a part of the reaction. The first reaction I think is really important. So when someone comes to you and says, so-and-so said this and you're like, oh, well, I don't want you hanging out with her anymore. Like, why would she say that? That's that's not okay. They're like, okay, note to self, never tell mom anything (laughs) my friends do, you know? And so really watching those first reactions when somebody, a lot of times I noticed that my kids would tell me something about someone else kind of like testing the waters. Like, so what would, what would mom do if this happened to me? You know, so-and-so cheated, like he got caught for cheating. I can say to it, one of two things, oh, that he did. I can't believe he would do that. That's not what good kids do. Or you can say, wow, he must be feeling a lot of pressure to get good grades. Like how are you feeling? You feeling okay in all your classes? Do you feel like cheating is wow. something like, hard for you? You know, opening up that question instead of shutting. I, anytime they bring something to you, figuring out how can I open this instead of mm. shut it, you know? And then when it comes to communication, just being light sometimes, having fun sometimes, like making fun of yourself here and there, not being afraid to let them see the human side of you. I love asking my kids for advice on situations I'm going through. Sometimes, Hey, you know, this is going on at work. What do you, what do you think I should do? Or what would you do? Or let me tell you something funny that happened, you know, with, with this relationship. I remember saying one time there was, there's this lady that keeps acting like she doesn't know who I am. And we've been in all these things together, you know, and it's just funny because you're like, we've been here together. We've been here together. And every time she's like, Oh, hi, I'm so-and-so. I'm like, we've met 400 times, (laughs) but asking your kids, does that ever happen to you? Is there anyone in your life that does that to you? Helping them understand you're just a person. You're just normal. You have good days. You have bad days. I was just talking to Vanessa Quigley and she was saying that, you know, she hates it when her daughters will say like, oh, I feel so ugly. And she's, you know, she immediately wants to be like, 
you're not ugly. You're beautiful. You're amazing. You know? And, but sometimes just being like, Oh, I'm sorry. You're having an ugly day. I have those too. It's the worst. And letting them know you're just, you're just human. You know, I think when they know who you are, they understand your intentions. They understand you're coming from a place of love. They're going to want to connect with you. Are they going to tell you everything? Probably not. Yeah. But you know, yeah. when, when it's important, they will be able to come to you. Totally. Yeah. It seems like to one of the real barriers potentially to connection that people are facing today is kids and teens. Well, and even our own use of social media and smartphones. It's very, it's become so common to see an entire family out at a restaurant and everybody's just on their phone, you know, and I'm guilty of this too. A lot of the time, like I'm sure my kids have very, you know, clear images in their mind of me, like on my phone and them trying to say something to me. And I'm just not like, not paying attention, but I think it goes, it goes both ways too. And I think statistics bear out that teens actually spend even more time than adults do on, on phones. So is there a way, given that that's the reality, I, like, and I guess part of it for me is that if I had my way, our kids would not have any social media, but my worry too, is that they're going to be ostracized or left out because that's where social connection is happening among their peers. And so I'm sure you've thought about this a lot, but is there a way to do this healthily? And what are your, what are your tips for parents that are trying to navigate this, this world? I, so I've thought so much about this because I just think it's probably one of the biggest challenges of our generation when it comes to parenting. And my oldest was basically on the forefront of that, like the wild west of cell phones with very little controls. And it was, it was definitely not ideal. And one of the things that I have learned is that the slower that you can go, the better. Mm. And then as a caveat to that, I think it's important for them to have things in our home so they can learn how to do it well. Mm. I think it's very different for every family, which is, I, you know, I hesitate to say an age or a time, but I've heard of a few people who, you know, they, their kid has, gets a smartphone when they're 18 and then all of a sudden the whole world is open to them and, and they don't have anyone to bounce those ideas off or have checks with them. One of the things that I think is super, super important that we have done with our, our kids as they get older is to let them know that they're never alone in their smartphone use, that I am all we are here for is to make sure that they are living happy and fulfilling lives. So if, for instance, we say, we feel like you, you know, they say, Hey, I feel like I'm ready for, uh, this certain app. And we talk about the pros and cons. We, you know, talk about if they're really ready and then to let them know that they are always, 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 always able to come to us and say, this isn't actually very good for me. And we are happy to take it off their phone, put a screen time passcode on whatever that is, but we are there to help them live their most successful lives with technology. And I'm not going to ask up 1 million questions about, oh, what happened? Why don't you think you can handle the internet on your phone anymore? It's awesome. Thanks for coming to me. I'm happy to put that screen time passcode on so that you can have some time where you're not bombarded by everything that's on your phone or happy to take the fall for you saying, Hey, they have to take a social media break, whatever that is. We are absolutely happy to be the tools for them to live that life. That is not a conversation that works as well with a 14 year old as it works with like a 16 or 17 year old. There are definitely boundaries and hard things that need, in my opinion, hard things that need to be happening to make sure that they don't have access to what they're not supposed to have access to. Um, you're being checked up on all those things. I think it's important to know the heart of your kid. So there's kids that it doesn't really matter what you do. They're going to try and get around everything. And there's kids who are like, I just need a couple barriers to keep me like being the person I want to be and knowing who your kids are and how much you need to, you know, dive in and lock down and all that. But also remembering brains are really, really underdeveloped and they're really not yeah. ready. I, I like to say, it's more important that your child is able to have a good high school experience than it is that they're the coolest kid in middle school because they have no boundaries or, or rules because a lot of those kids end up making a lot of poor choices that burn a lot of bridges for the times when they could actually be having a good time later. So just being involved, working through things, being someone that your kid can come to, checking up on their texting and saying, hey, I saw that you said you hated this person. Like, 
how do you think that's going to go over if somebody screenshots that and sends it to her? You know, like those types of conversations, helping them understand that what you want is for them to live their most successful life, not for them to just be keeping rules because you say, yeah. or you heard they were the good rules to keep. So, yeah. What about for just for ourselves, for adults who are using social media, have you found a way to do that successfully that, that creates connection as opposed to inhibiting it? Uh, so that, that can be tricky. I actually just did a post about, I think there were seven questions you can ask yourself whether or not you should be following an account or not. And doing regular social media cleanouts is I think really important. But the question that really kind of has stayed in my mind just for myself is, um, does this account help me live my best life or just make me wish I was living their life? And <laughs> I think, that that might, <laughs> I think that works not just for, you know, people who are famous online, but also for people in your own life. If, if there's a friend whose online life makes you like them less than you like them in person, go ahead and mute them. Social media should be increasing our connection. Um, it should be uplifting us. It should be inspiring us. And, and if it's not doing those things, um, then it's not serving its correct purpose. Um, it takes a while, but if you put a lot of effort into cultivating a feed that lifts and inspires and connects you, then social media doesn't have to be something that, um, is such a downer, right? It can be something that is actually good for you. As long as you can keep your time in check while you're on it. <laughs> it's interesting. Social media algorithms are so, so smart. They know where you spend your time. They know what you like. They know what you comment on. They know what you watch. And yeah. so if you are really, really deliberate in what you spend your time with and what you interact with online, you should have a feed that reflects your values. It, wow. That's so true. I, but it's so easy to not be intentional about it, to just sort of let it accidentally become whatever it becomes. And then, and then it's just a, a, a time suck. And sometimes it sucks your spirit, you know, sometimes it really is draining totally. in every way. Yeah. Oh, I well, love and that. Even, like, even just a little deeper, you know, what might be good for one person might not be good for someone else. Right. So if there's, there might be a really great time for you to follow home decorating <laughs> accounts, right. If you are building a new home, then it is a great time for you to follow those. If, if all your friends are moving into new homes and you're stuck in an apartment following a bunch of new home decorating accounts might be really draining to your spirit, you know, yeah. or if you're struggling with body images, like with body image and feeling good about who you are in your, in your own skin, yeah. a fitness account, probably you don't want to have a whole feed full of fitness accounts. That's not right for who you are at the time. Now, maybe a few years later, you're like, I'm ready to get in shape. This is, you know, what I want to do. Great. Have motivational people on there that, you know, remind you that it's time to work out or whatever, but I think a lot of times we want to blame social media for a lot of things in our life and, and we're shifting that blame to social media. When we forget that we have a lot of control with what we spend our time and our energy on. And the more we see ourselves as people who I create my own feed, I decide what to do with my time. I decide who I'm going to give my energy to, then it's a lot more empowering than feeling like we're at the mercy of an algorithm all the time. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That makes sense. Yeah. Wow. Well, Brooke, this has been absolutely maybe the most like practical podcast episode we've ever yeah. done. Honestly, I feel <laughs> like I've got so many ideas for like how to be such, I mean, just how to improve my own life and my relationship with my kids just after this hour that we spent. So honestly, thank you. It's been incredible. Yeah. Um, is there, is there anything else you wanted to bring up before we sort of wrap up here? You know, I feel like you guys hit on all the most important things, but just the last message I want to leave is just, it's never too late. It's never too late to live the life or to be the parent or to be the disciple that you want to be. I think so many times we get the message like, well, I'm already here or my kids are already at this point. Yeah. Um, I had the most, I, I did a post a while ago about, you know, parenting and there was a mom who came to her kids, like when she was a grandma. And just said she was sorry that she did some things wrong and she wished she could do it again. And I just how much she loved her kids. And I just was so touched by her experience and the fact that her kids just opened their heart and brought her right back in. And um, as I think about that, I just think about like 
our savior. And it just really is. It's just, it's never too late to just start being the person um, that you know you want to be. And so sometimes I think in, in podcasts or posts where there's a lot of advice, people think, oh, I'm so far gone. I, I haven't connected with my teenagers or I, you know, I haven't been very diligent in my faith or whatever. There is just so much beauty in realizing that the whole point of the gospel is to start now. And it doesn't matter where you've been. I love the idea of the laborers that came in at the last second. I know that parable bugs people, but hallelujah for those people who got to spend all that time working with the master. And then for the person that came in at the very end that still got the exact same reward. So it is never, ever too late to start becoming the person you want to be. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's such a great place to end. Thank you. It was Thank a great, you you guys are great interviewers. Awesome questions. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Okay, thanks so much for listening, and we really hope that you enjoyed that conversation with Brooke Romney. Again, you can check out more of her work at brookromney.com, on Amazon, or on Instagram at Brooke Romney Writes. We want to send Brooke a huge thanks for coming on. And as always, if Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get a chance, we'd love for you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. It really helps get the word out about Faith Matters, and we really appreciate the support. Thanks again for listening. And as always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.